United we play. United we win. It's his world and we're all just paying the rent. All hits all the time. We are family. Max Scherzer, double digit case. We're busting ours to kick yours. Fun to watch. Minus 15. Respect all, fear none. Into the upper deck. Intensity is not a perfume. Hello, Utah Street. Five, four, three, two, one. Back in our matching red Nationals quarter zips, it is the Mass and All Excess podcast. Bobby Blanco and Amy Jones coming at you live from the Mass and Web studio. Thank you so much for tuning in, making us part of this Tuesday afternoon. We are coming on live on Mass and Nationals Facebook page, YouTube channel, wherever you can watch us. Be sure to tune in, hit that like button, subscribe so you get the notification. And then also check out the podcast after the fact, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud. We did a later podcast last week, did we not, Amy? Was it later in the week yeah, or was it, was it normal? Thursday, it was I Thursday, I think. Thursday? So yeah, I was going to say, I feel like we were just Just here. right here. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, how have you been? In the, huh? in, I was going to say, how was your week? But I guess it's only been like five days. Yeah, it's been a... Yeah, it's... Just been just, a, it was a quiet weekend, right? Because like there was the first weekend in a long time, there was no football, obviously yeah. not in baseball season just yet. Um, Did you watch the Pro Bowl? I watched a little bit of it. Had it on the background while uh, my fiance and I were just like playing board games and... Probably totally paid attention of maybe completely 30 no. seconds. It I, was bad. I just can't get into it. Yeah. I can't it makes you appreciate it. the baseball all-star game a lot more when you see something that yeah, bad. Yeah, and even, like, for me, for, like, baseball all-star week, I still like the home run derby more than I like the yeah. actual game. And, like, in basketball, you know, the dunk contest. And I like the still skills competitions more. So the pro ball is just so, like, anticlimactic Yeah, me. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it was, it's not football. They don't tackle... I, I heard like a lot of uh, sports talk stuff have been talking about how to fix that and people mm-hmm. saying they should change the flag, they should change it to uh, just a skills competition, uh, just a seven on seven, something like that. Yeah. But yeah, when you think about it and then you look at at least baseball, they play an actual game. And when you used to have, well, used to, when you have guys like Max Scherzer starting the game, oh, and yeah. they're pumping 100 still, even though it's a game that doesn't matter. Um and, you know, you have some of the best talents, you know, swinging for the fences. That makes it more fun. So I think baseball definitely, when it comes down to the actual game, probably one of the best probably all-star the best, games. Yeah. I think that in hockey. I really like the NHL, what they had done with that. The There's four divisions, and they play a three-on-three, like, tournament-style all-star oh, see, game, which is that. really that's, cool. That's yeah, That's cool. I like that. Um, the NBA all-star game has gotten better because they did that whole, like, fake fantasy draft, right? And then it's just way more competitive now. But it's still like, you know, the final score is like 200 to 199. So it's like, right. it's really it's kind of <laughs> tough. So, yes, the Pro Bowl is by far the worst. It makes you appreciate baseball's All-Star mm-hmm. Week, which, of course, is in July. So that'll be fun to look forward to. Um, speaking of baseball, last week you and I talked a lot about um, the Nationals pitching prospects and try to project when they would debut. Obviously, this is a different farm system right now. Um and let's get into that part of it, too, because this week we're going to be doing position players mm-hmm. and trying to project the position players. For the longest time, the Nationals farm system was full of pitchers, and it was always which pitching prospect was going to come up. Not too many uh, position player guys. You have guys like Luis Garcia and Carter Keeboom coming up in the past couple of years. Um, but now, especially like in the top 15, I think, I think it's – six or seven are position players. Mm -hmm. And I was going back a couple years, Amy, there are so many, like MLB pipeline has, you can go back on their prospect rankings over a decade, back to 2011. And like, you just go back to 2020, 2019. It's like almost all pitchers. And a lot of the same position player prospects, Tres Barreras, um, that have just been there forever for a long, long time and just never made it through. Now, there's a lot of focus on these position player guys. We're going to talk a lot about them, and a lot of them are very far away still from the, mm-hmm. the major league level. But in terms of um, a different focus for the Nats organization as a whole, they're turning their focus to position players more in the minor league system too. I mean, obviously, there's still the emphasis on pitching, but we're seeing a lot more highly rated position players in their top 30, top 15, top 10 than we've seen in a couple of years. Which is kind of good to see because you know, for the last decade, they've 
taken a whole lot of pitchers there in the first round. And you see this influx of pitchers in, in the top rankings in their farm system and only a handful, maybe even less, actually make it. Um, so it's so hard to tell with pitchers because you can have a whole lot in those high rankings and then a uh, they don't have a high probability of necessarily turning out. Whereas position players, you can kind of project them a little more accurately. So it's good to see kind of this transition over. They still have the top guys in their system, the Cade Cavallis, the Jackson Rutledge, but you're seeing more of an emphasis on not only drafting these position players, but they also got a lot back at the trade deadline this year. And that's why you're going to see more of an influx um, in their rankings of position players. And you think of some of their top position player prospects of the past, I think part of the reason that you don't see, you haven't seen so many position players in their top thirty, top ten, whatever you want to be, whatever, however you want to narrow it down, is because a lot of those guys graduated really quickly and became successful. Look back at Bryce; you can go all the way back to Bryce Harper, mm -hmm. Anthony Rendon, and then now the past couple of years, Victor Robles, Juan Soto, Carter Keeboom was kind of forced into that situation right because of injuries, and he needed to come up probably sooner than uh, he was ready. We've talked about that. Luis Garcia, same in twenty twenty. Um, with some injuries forcing him being called up. Same with the thing last year, early last year. So a lot of the top-rated position players that have come through this system graduated quickly and that's weren't true. prospects for very long. And that's why you kind of saw not a log jam, but just a, a higher percentage of position player, uh, excuse me, pitchers in their farm system as, as top prospects than position players. Which again, kind of like you said, it's a good thing. I mean, that means you're drafting well. You means that you're acquiring these young, talented position players that can then go on and, and contribute at the major league level. It's just now at the time where this Nationals franchise is, you need these guys to kind of fill out and add depth in the farm system. You don't need immediate help at the major league level right now. You need these guys to work their way up. One of the main guys we're going to start get started talking about is obviously Brady House, the first round pick from last year. Um, you're going to need him or going to want him to work his way up through the system, get a, some good experience at Double A, Triple A before eventually making his debut. If if not that you want to hold him back if he's ready, but ideally you would see these guys grow up and the farm system becomes a little more diverse in terms of their top prospects. Yeah, and they're, the Nationals have been much more likely to push position players along a lot quicker, like you see in Victor Robles, Juan Soto, um, even Luis Garcia, and take a little bit more time um, in the development of their pitchers. So that's one of the reasons you see that. Um, and it's not, we're, we're talking about these guys and most of them are a good bit ways off, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because, you know, that means in three years when the Nationals are competitive again, maybe even two, these guys might be ready to make their debut. Yeah, and then of course there's like, and when we talk about, when we had this conversation, we made this, said this last week too, in terms of pitchers, you know, there's different factors that play into when these guys will actually debut and mm -hmm. predict and remember last week we said a lot of these pitchers of those pitchers if you missed it go back and check out that podcast you can also watch us if you want um on the youtube page or facebook but we said you know a lot of those guys we predicted would make their debut sometime this year when this year unsure but probably sometime in 2022 you're not going to hear a lot of 2022s mm -hmm. today you're going to hear a lot of 2023 2024 maybe even 2025s uh, because like you said there are, are a lot of these guys are a couple years away most of these guys their professional experience tops out at rookie level the rookie level florida complex mm -hmm. league so that's very far away from being major league ready. Uh, I think there's only a hand and some of these guys are already on the 40 man roster. They're probably close to cracking uh, like Donovan Casey. They're a little older. These guys that were acquired via trade. Um, but a lot of the in-house guys are rookie level, lower levels of mm -hmm. single a um, barely have reached double a. And then there's barely any, but a few that did reach double A and really struggled. Yeah. And I don't think we're going to see them back at double A to start the season necessarily. Yeah. So, yeah, well, let's get started then. Um, and with the number two overall prospect in the national system right now, that is of course, Brady house last year's first round draft pick number 11 overall out of Winterboro high school in Georgia, tall kid, six, four, two fifteen. He's a right-handed batter. He also throws right-handed, um, he impressed a lot, really. I mean, you know, talk about, he was one projected as one of the best, um, high school bats in this draft. Um, uh, and, and the nationals were surprised that he fell to them at 11 and, and they're, they're they, they think they're lucky that he did. Um, and he, 
It was like I said, only 18 years old. He plays shortstop, and he impressed at the rookie level. Florida Compacts League, hitting 322 um, and a couple of extra base hits, including four home runs, showing some good power early on, and that is what you want to see um, in a top prep prospect that is projected to be a shortstop. Yeah, exactly. He has the power, he has the bat speed, and he's able to hit the ball to all fields. He had one of the best X velocities in the 2021 draft. That's why he was one of the best bats in that draft. And I think the Nationals were surprised that he fell to them. He had the seventh highest signing bonus in this 2021 draft class. Um, And he did look good down in Florida this year. And he's making all the plays. I still think that he's able to end up at third base with his size. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not because he's he's lacking and he's not making the plays at shortstop. That's just where Chris Klein pretty much said outwardly that they expect him to end up being a third baseman long term. He's shown a plus arm too, which also helps translate to that um, transition to third base if he feels like he needs to make it. But remember, we talked, we heard from Brady House when he was drafted. Uh, we've seen quotes from him. He expects to play shortstop so that'll be interesting thing to track as his professional career continues to advance if he fits at shortstop and the other thing too we talk about a lot of guys not making very uh or appearing very high up in the on the minor league system there's a lot of shortstops we're gonna be talking about today Mm -hmm. again there there's no log jam near the top of the farm system so we have no one bearing down to become breakthrough and be the next star shortstop of the future, taking over for Trey Turner. But there are a handful of shortstops that are highly rated, but are just on the lower levels of the farm system that we're going to talk about today. Brady House leading that group. Yeah, for example, Sammy Infante had to move over and play at second base for most of this time down in Florida because Brady House was mm-hmm. playing at shortstop. So for a little bit, when all of these guys are kind of playing at the same level, it might be a good opportunity. They're competing against each other and trying to figure out what their true position is long term. Yeah, he's not as fast, so maybe third base is a little bit, a lot less ground to cover over at third base. Uh, but if you have that third base power back, that you can slot, you know, where think about where Anthony Rendon mm-hmm. uh, hit in this lineup. You can hit him as high as two or as low as like four. Um, that's a great bat to have in your lineup. Uh, scouts have compared him to a more athletic version of a Joey Gallo, mm-hmm. which is an impressive uh, comparison for an 18 year old kid. But again, his size, his strength, you like the bat speed, the arm strength plays well at third base. It's just gonna be interesting to see where Brady House fits in. Or the Nationals foresee him. He wants to play shortstop. The Nationals, he probably projects better as a third baseman. And then needs will come up. You know, if the net, like the same thing happened with other guys in the system. If the need, like Trey Turner is a perfect example. He was a shortstop, but they had a need for an outfielder. So they threw him in the outfield when he came up as a rookie. Obviously, he made his way back to shortstop. But if the Nationals need a third baseman, Carter Keaton doesn't pan out in two years. You have Brady House, and he has probably right. can probably pull off that job pretty easily. Right. He- he described. He said he wants to play shortstop. Right. He kind of described himself as a Trevor Story s player. I think mm-hmm. he said yeah, after he, he was after he was drafted. But the good news is, is he has the arm to play third base. He can play there if the Nationals need him to play there, or if that's a better fit. Um, you're probably not going to see him within the next two years. No. I think if you had to predict, he's 18 now, um, coming out of high school, of course, which makes a difference in how quick you can move up in your development, Um, but probably more likely to debut in 2024. Yeah, MLB Pipeline has his ETA at 2024. I would probably agree with that if his, I mean, you know, you don't see a lot of, I mean, this is why he was rated as the top um, um, prospect in the the 2021 high school class. You know, you don't see a lot of kids do this well, even at rookie-level ball in their first professional season in an OPS of 970 mm-hmm. um, and, and the, like I said the extra base hits and also drew seven walks so he's got an eye at the plate too um, 16 games small sample size I know let's see how he starts off this season he's probably will probably start off at Fredericksburg I would guess maybe um, I don't think they would send him back down to Florida get a couple more bats since he dominated so well down there um, but it'll be interesting to progress it's always like the first year, right? Like how he progresses this year will dictate when, if we see him in 2024 or even sooner. And, and, you know, high school to the pros is a good jump. I mean, granted, he was playing down there in the Florida Complex League, but you're still seeing better pitching yeah. than you saw in high school. So he started his 
adjustment well. And some of these other guys we're talking about didn't start so well, but started to heat up as they, they, they get more used to better pitching mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So he's off to a good start, uh, and we'll see how he does in 2022. Number two overall prospect in the national system. Get used to that name. He'll be a household name in Brady House. Another 18-year-old shortstop, Armando Cruz, the number five overall prospect in the Nationals. Very, a lot smaller than Brady, 5'10", 160, bats right, throws right. He was a 2021 international signing out of the Dominican Republic. Also only uh, played as high as the rookie level Florida Complex League this past season, and his ETA is a couple years behind Brady House at 2025. Um, a lot of skills going around with Armando Cruz. This is why the Nationals made him a priority um, in that, that last international signing class. Um, it's just young, raw talent, smaller size at shortstop. But like I said, we're going to be talking a lot about shortstops and can he kind of fend off the competition and prove that he is uh, the top defender in this class? Yeah, I think Armando Cruz's potential completely depends on his progression at the plate. He's yeah. known for his defense. He has quick feet, really good hands, great instincts. And that's why, you know, he they signed him out of this international market. Um, in his 48 games in the Dominican Summer League this past year, he had 232, slugged 305, and had an OPS of 597. So not a terrible year. And he's making, they said, throughout the summer, he made progression at the plate. Um but his, you know, his potential, I think, completely depends on if he's able to hit. You don't want him to end up being uh, what you, you hate to say, but like Victor Robles, yep. you know, yep. the, the, the production at the plate just isn't there. So we'll see. He's, he's young. He's only 18. He's smaller, so he's probably never really going to hit for a whole lot of power. Um, but it's just he, he has a, a good way to go. 24, 25 is probably the first time you'll be talking about him in the same sentence as the big league. The team. skill set is there, though. The Nationals really like, especially with his hands, his, the, they like how he uses his hands in the field with his glove and in the batter's box, being able to whip around the bat across the strike zone. So the skill set is there. And you mentioned a comparison to Victor Robles. He does not have the power that Robles was projected mm -hmm. to have or scouted as. His power is his worst one of them of his grades only at a 40 on a 2080 scale. But then you look at his run and arm strength and his hit power, it's 55, 55, 50 respectively. And his field is 60. So they love the defense. They love the speed. He also swept 11 bags this past season. So when he gets on base, he's a threat and he plays a premium position with really good glove work and a lot of speed to cover a lot of ground. That is what projects him to probably be a better fit at shortstop than a Brady house. I know we see shortstops be bigger nowadays and, and more athletic just because they can be. But if Brady House does eventually make the transition over to third base, Armando Cruz probably fits in as the Nationals' top prospect as a shortstop right yeah. there because of all those things I just said, the speed, the glove, the arm strength, everything right there. Yeah, exactly. It's just a matter of being raw and being young and, you know, having a little bit to go. He might drop um, when, when this year's rankings come out preseason, but I think if he starts to hit this year, that could – he could move up quickly. Yeah, you mentioned about the, the the ceiling. I mean, and his offense, his bat will dictate how far he can advance in the system and whether or not he can make the major leagues yeah. because the defensive skill sets are there. Um, all right, so when uh, Armando Cruz last year signed out of the Dominican Republic, he had then set a an uh, organization record for the signing bonus for a national prospect. That was tied with Yasiel Antuna, mm -hmm. who's the next person we're going to talk about, number eight overall prospect in the national system, an older gentleman at the <laughs> old age of 22. Yeah. He's projected to play. He's kind of a shortstop third base hybrid as well, signed back in 2016 out of the DR, a little taller, um, six foot 195. He's a switch hitter, though, so that's a skill set the Nationals are eyeing right there and probably also um, led to – them then giving one of the si highest signing bonuses in franchise history. Um, he topped out at high single A uh, Wilmington this year. His ETA is this year, in fact, 2022. Is this the year we see Yasiel Tuna finally break through the ranks? I think it's definitely possible. Um, it just depends on how he starts the season. He's probably most likely to start at double A, I would say. Um, this is a guy who got off to a slow start in 2021. He went four for 67, um, but then he ended up hitting over 300 in July and August and really turned that season around. He finished the season hitting 227. Um, he showed a little bit of pop. He had 12 homers, 65 RBIs in his 106 games there in Wilmington. Like you mentioned, switch hit 
hitter, good bat speed on both sides of the plate. Um, he had dealt with some injuries yep. over the last two years. Um, of course, in 2019, he dealt with those injuries, but then 2021 don't, didn't have a minor league season, which probably halted his, his development a little bit. Um, but, and I think they're working on moving him to the outfield hmm. um, a little bit. So that might change some things up about his projections, but he's probably out of all of the guys that we've talked about so far, we might see him the soonest. Yeah, I think so because so far he's the oldest. He's been around the longest time back in 2016. And just to, for comparison's sake, I saw this comparison on MLB pipeline. They signed him for 3.9 million. Like I said, then a franchise record for comparison's sake, the national signed Luis Garcia for only 1.3 million. Mm. So that goes to show how much this, the guys within the scouting department really think of Yasiel Antuna. Um, and kind of like the Luis Garcia, you know, the opportunity just could present itself. He's 22 years old. You know, God forbid if, if Garcia goes down, Carter Kiva goes down, if one of the um, older veterans that they have signed to minor league deals who make the team and then play the infield, they go down. If just a, a spot opens up where they need a – uh, an infielder to come in and be maybe a defensive replacement. Of, you know, it, it could be Yasiel Tuna. That could be his door to the system. He is on the 40 man roster. Um, so, you know, that would be an easy way for them to pick him up and, and bring him out to the major leagues. Uh, but yeah, he does seem like he's the closest out of all of them. He doesn't have maybe the, the highest ceiling that the two guys we just talked to prior do. Right. Maybe that's why he's ranked behind them, but he could have a place as a, pretty solid infielder backup infielder on a, on a team um, d down the line yeah the good thing about him is the bats not missing baseball yeah. America said he's the best hitter for average in this organization and the best power hitter in, in this organization so the closest to debuting out of all of these guys that we've talked about so he far he did also you mentioned this the uh, positioning he did play a lot of second base too mm -hmm. at the alternate training site in 2020 so that he can kind of play all – he's listed as shortstop third base. He can kind of play all three uh, infield positions outside of first baseman, which brings me to another point real quick before we go even further. We're not talking about any first baseman today, which I found was interesting. When I was going back and looking at this list and doing some research, the Nationals are very severely lacking first baseman mm -hmm. depth in their system, and that's going to bring me to a question I have at the end of the conversation. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's just a little nugget that we are not talking a lot about first baseman. So that's interesting about the Nationals farm system. Next up is number nine prospect, Dalen Lyle, 19 years old, outfielder, 2021 second round pick out of Trinity High School in Louisville, where he was, I think, the state player of the year, and they won the state tournament. Um, oh, second, yep, second straight Gatorade High School state player of the year last year um, in Kentucky. So highly rated guy, second round pick. Um, he was labeled as one of the best pure hitters in his draft mm -hmm. class coming out of high school. Um, still really raw, like, like Brady House, only 19 years old. His uh, ETA is 2024, but he's a left-handed bat, so that's something that could, you know, how much the Nationals, and hey, baseball in general, they prioritize left-handed hitters. Right, and he dealt with an arm injury this year and mostly DH down there in the Florida Complex League, so you didn't get to see a whole lot of him defensively. Um, he doesn't have an overpowering arm or speed, so I think they project him to end up probably in left field um, over center field, and again, you won't see him until maybe 2025. Um, but for now, they comment on his quiet setup, but he has a repeatable swing. Um, might develop some more power later, but you're not really seeing that right now. Uh, I think 20, he's only 18, so 2022 will be a good year for him to get his feet back under him, hopefully healthy. Hopefully he's over that arm injury, um, and you'll see his, more of his defensive ability this year. Yeah, his bad, I mean, he has gap-to-gap -gap power. They liked his spray chart, um, the ability to hit to all fields. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he get a lot of good exit velocity off that bat, so he got that kind of natural strength that will only, of course, develop over time as he gets older, fills out his body. Six foot, 195. You continue to probably add a couple pounds to that, and he could be a pretty solid, athletically built outfielder. Yeah, he'll probably end up projecting, finishing up being stuck in a corner somewhere. Uh, I don't know if his speed and athleticism really have, has him – being able to man center field. Mm -hmm. um, but still, I mean, that's where you kind of put your, if he be, develops that power and is able to be a strong left-handed hitter bat, a la Juan Soto, you know, that's where you would put him anyways in, in the corner outfield. You don't need him to be a speedy guy in center field um, if he's able to, you know, if he's hitting for extra bases and hitting home runs um, like he's predicted to be able to. 
And then next on this list, we have Jeremy De La Rosa. He's 20 outfielder. He's another international signing out of the Dominican Republic back in 2018. 2021 is the first time that we got to see him in a full minor league season. He did play at the alternate site for a little bit, and he was one of the youngest players there. So they're trying to get him at bats, trying to see more out of him. Um, but in 2021, he really struggled. He was kind of rusty, hit just over 200 with a 595 OPS and a 40% strikeout rate. Uh, but he continues to progress at the plate towards the end of the season. He looked better. He showed a whole lot more power. He's just more raw. But overall, yeah. he's a good athlete, um, and that's a good sign for, for Jeremy. 20-year-old left-handed bat, only, pitch, only played at Fredericksburg last year. His ETA is 2023, but you mentioned the strikeouts. I mean, he struck out an over a third of his at bats, mm -hmm. which is a lot. So uh, maybe he's just needing more experience. Maybe he just needs to see more professional pitching, get some more at bats. Under. But as a high strikeout percentage, like you mentioned, over 40% and over a third of his at bats. So that needs to come way, way down. And maybe he get on base more. I mean, just anyway, only 30 walks to 122 strikeouts. That's something that's not going to be impressive to Nationals coaches in the minor league system. Um, but he does have a solid hit tool makeup. I mean, he can become a, a, a player that brings a lot of just overall average hitting. You know, he's not going to hit for power. He's maybe won't hit too high for average, but can like, be somewhere in the middle right. where he is. You want him to just get on base at first, right? And, and, you know, you're not looking to hit a bunch of home runs or, or even doubles or whatever. Let's see him adjust to professional hitting. We know about all, you know, the lack of a 2020 season has thrown a lot of these guys out of whack. Maybe he just needs another just full season under his belt to get some more experience. Um, and he can kind of keep developing those tools that project him to be a pretty solid tool uh, hitter guy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, long term could be a fourth outfielder, you know, in-house option. I don't think we'll see him probably till towards the end of 2023, maybe 2024 soonest. The earliest. interesting too is that they also placed him at the alternate training site in 2020. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he is, uh, excuse me, he's 20 now. So he was 18 back there playing against a lot of guys. One of the youngest guys that are, there. Like you mentioned, a little older. So you would think that experience would have helped, you know, advance his development and at a higher rate. And it just hasn't panned out last year. Maybe this year it kind of does, and he kind of gets a full season under his belt, actually playing games. You know, it's different playing at the alternate training site versus playing against other competition when you're playing the same guys every day in, day out, and you kind of know what's coming because you know the pitchers that well. So maybe just needs a more, you know, professional like schedule in terms of yeah that makes a huge against, difference yeah. real games seeing real live pitching makes yeah. a big difference and just being thrown into the alternate alternate site being one of the youngest guys can't be easy obviously that they they thought he was ready mm -hmm. or they wouldn't have done that to him because that could be detrimental to his development um but you know getting a full season under your belt real season is good and he'll be able to continue hopefully the progress that he made in 2021 and 2022 number 14 overall on the nationals farm system is sammy infante another short stop 2020 second round pick it was the 71st overall a compensatory pick for losing anthony rendon in free agency um, he was out of high school, one senior Edward Pace High School in Miami Gardens, Florida. 6'1", 185, so a pretty tall and lanky uh, high schooler uh, at the time, I guess was 18 years old, now 20. Bats right, throws right. He played all of last season at rookie level Florida Compacts League and is now expected to make his debut in 2024. Um, the, the odds of him sticking at shortstop long term don't look great because he's what already the fourth shortstop exactly. that we're talking about on this list. I think the Nationals really like the tools and especially at the plate. He's shown really good bat speed and bat uh, discipline in, inside the batter's box. But it's just where do you place him in the field because there's just so many guys blocking his path to becoming a long-term shortstop that it's hard to see Sammy unless he just makes an incredible improvement over this last offseason into this year it's just kind of hard to see him find a place at shortstop somewhere yeah exactly he has the arm to stay at shortstop but like i had mentioned earlier he played second base down there in florida because brady house was mm -hmm. playing shortstop so that might you know hinder how many games he does get to play at shortstop along with the fact that we're talking about so many other shortstops in this conversation it's not that he doesn't have the arm to play there but it just might be a matter of 
fitting in in this organization. Uh, I think at this point, w- where his where he plays long term and his hit tool is probably the biggest question. He had two fifteen in Florida in those thirty seven games, um, but. He was one of the best shortstops in that 2020 high school class. They signed him over slot value. Um, he's 20 years old, so not one of the youngest guys no, that we're talking older. about on this list. Yeah, well, and, and I think another part of his not being able to lack at or stick at shortstop will be he's not the fastest guy. I mean, tall kid, six six foot one, you know, outside of Brady House, one of the taller shortstops mm-hmm. we've talked about, um, almost 200 pounds already at 20, at 20 years old. So, uh, and it's it's funny we're saying that. Oh, he's, you know, he's a little bit bigger, six one, and then we we go back to Brady House and yeah, he's six four. Six, we four, don't even well like, over you don't mention pounds. it because yeah. he's he's able to to compensate for that, <laughs> right? But you know, I mean, what does kind of translate into playing shortstop was is that he's highly rated in baseball IQ. The rats really like mm-hmm. his ability to adjust on the fly, uh, learn the game, real student of the game, as I like to say. So that was one of his calling cards coming out of the draft, a very high IQ in terms of playing the field, and that's what you really want out of your shortstop because that's the captain out there. That's your leader in terms of making infield adjustments and, and positioning everybody. So that is what might help him develop as a, as a shortstop a little bit better, but who's to say he can't also do that at second base, even third base. He played for a little bit of third base over there as well. So, um, yeah, the path up to short is, is not blocked. It's just harder for him to get there. Um, especially when he's still only pitching or only playing down at rookie level. I mean, you know, he's going to be in the next wave at Fredericksburg or Wilmington along with Brady House. So that's going to be someone who's probably going to be playing shortstop over him. Um, it's just going to be tough for him to get some at bats while playing short. Mm-hmm. And maybe Brady House moves over to third and that fixes a little bit of that problem. But the one thing is, is you're not just talking about. Uh, this kind of jam for one year, they're going to be moving up together, most likely if they keep progressing at the same rate. Yeah. So, um, Well, that kind of rounds up the guys in the top 15 that we really wanted to talk about. Are there any guys outside of the top 15 you wanted to mention um, in terms of position players and, and when they we could possibly see them and how they would advance? Before we get to my, my other question. I think maybe. Be the only one, Jackson Clough. I think that's an important person to talk about. Yeah, yeah. he's we've he's kind of fallen off of this conversation. He dealt with a hand hand injury this past season, but then he redeemed himself in the Arizona Fall League. Um, he's making some adjustments at the plate, being more aggressive. Uh, he, you're seeing that he's able to use all fields now. Baseball America ranked him as the best defensive infielder in this organization, which I thought was really interesting. The Nationals are kind of moving Moving him, on, moving him along a little bit quicker than everybody else because he is 25. It's interesting. He only played a full season and started a full season in 2019 because he went to BYU. He went on, on a mission trip for seasons 2017 and 2018. So he's a little bit kind of behind the curve. Um, doesn't mean that he can't make up for, for that time, but I think they're trying to move him along a little bit quicker because he is 25. Yeah, and, you know, you mentioned the injuries. He uh, he broke his thumb only 10 days into the season back in May, so limiting his early action, he missed six weeks, and then he broke his wrist in mid-August. So you really only have, like, June, no, I guess six weeks in May, so you only have, like, July and beginning of August of, of actual good sample size from Jackson Clough exactly. this past season, hence throwing him in the Arizona Fall League where he – Played really well. We talked about that on the podcast. You just mentioned it. So it's kind of like, all right, we've seen what he can do. It's just putting it all together. And you mentioned the age, who 25 years old, one of the older guys that we're talking about in this system. Um, 2019 sixth round pick. I mean, you would like you would have hoped that you've kind of found a diamond in the rough right there, a late sixth rounder that you could maybe bring up and then become one of your top prospects, but injuries have really held him back. He played at double A this past season. He's projected to debut at some point this season. I just don't know where the Nationals will fit him because you obviously have Luis Garcia and Carter Keeboom already up here. You have signed a bunch of uh, veteran infielders to minor league deals. There's just not, and he's already ranked 19th in the system. I mean, we talked about a lot of younger guys, albeit guys below him in the farm system in terms of playing lower levels, but 
I mean, Jackson Clough would really need to take that Arizona Fall League momentum and carry over to this year and have a strong start at Double A to earn a promotion, at least a Triple A, before the Nationals can consider bringing him up. And you're, you know, like you said, 25 years old, kind of running, not running out of time. We've seen guys, you know, make their debuts later in their age, but you really like, want, hopefully, in the early to mid 20s age group before you you kind of start. Right. Look at the clock, right? And he's a middle infielder like the rest of these right. guys. And the bad news for him is that they keep moving him up and he keeps uh, doing worse, if yeah. you will. I mean, he only hit 190 at double A. Arizona Fall League, though, he hit 342 with an 887 OPS, which is much better. One home run, 14 RBIs in 22 games, which is 22 games, but still a, a decent sample size compared mm-hmm. to him only playing two months ish at the end of the season. Right. Here you play 35 with double a. So it's like, it's only, that's only 13 more games. So in a a healthy season, you don't know what you're going to get. The problem is you're running out of healthy seasons when you're 25 and you're hitting 190 at double a. And you also, I think he played five games at Fredericksburg, five games at Wilmington. Mm -hmm. And then made that jump. He didn't play high at all. And made that. Okay. So it was Fredericksburg and rookie level last year. Right. Or was it? Yes. Yeah. So he didn't even make, he didn't even play at Wilmington. And there's only five games, yep. but I mean, played that, in the, the Florida Complex League five in low A and made for that his ju- injuries right and made that jump to double A. Yeah. So they're moving him along. He's just got to hit. Yeah, I mean, there is. Yeah, you're right. They're like giving him the opportunity to show what he can do at a higher level because as a 25 year old, this is where he would be. You know, he probably should have been there last year. You know, you as a 24 year old now mm-hmm. as a 25 year old, you definitely should be a, a pretty established double A bat. Uh, our player overall, and he's, he's not yeah. quite there yet. I mean, you, he hit below 200. You know, he overall over across all three levels, he only hit 214. Right. So it's uh, it's not it's an uphill battle for Jackson Clough, a guy that had a lot of high praise, especially looking back at the past couple of uh, of farm system um, not farm system rankings, prospect rankings, yeah. where he was one of the higher ranked position players because there was such an influx of pitchers, mm-hmm. and now he's basically stayed in the same window of that top 30 i think he was 18 when he entered now he's 19 a a ranked prospect but there are so many more position players ranked above him albeit they are younger right and the best news for him is that the defense is there baseball america's best defensive infielder in this organization which is saying something because we just went through a whole lot of them um he just has to hit and he's gonna have to hit quick do you think you could there's any chance you see him at the end of 2022 at the end yeah at the end of the season, because if, if he has a good good year at Harrisburg, even if it's just Harrisburg, I, I mentioned a, a jump to Rochester earlier. He doesn't necessarily have to make that jump. If he does, great. But if he just has a strong year at Harrisburg, he's their everyday shortstop, their, whatever they need to stick him, mm-hmm. great. And, at, you know, I, it, it also depends on – what the new CBA says in terms of roster sizes and how they're, we saw them only expand by a handful last year. So there might not be room for him, but you know, if he has a strong season and who knows what this infield is going to look like, especially at the end of the season, after the trade deadline, there might be a chance for him to come up and, and, and point. get a shot at it. I, I would not be surprised to see Jackson Clough in September. And at that point, I don't know if he'll still be 25 or he'll have turned 26, but it's, you know, why not? Let them right. get him in there, see what you can do. And, you know, if you, you can't produce at the big league level, then it is what it is. <laughs> his birthday's in December, so he just turned, just 25, turned 25. So this is will be his 25 season. Yeah, I mean, right. And that's kind of like at that point, especially with who knows what the, like I said, the infield's going to look like with prospects coming up, trade deadline, you know, injuries happen. Why not see what you have? He's going to be 25, 26 next year. You're, like I said, you're – kind of running a not completely out of time but kind of running out of time on on jackson clough and how much time you can uh give him to Mm -hmm. continue his development um real quick you know the nat a a lot of these guys we talked about the difference between this uh top 30 versus years past with a lot more position players that's because of the trade deadline right and and a lot of these guys now caber ruiz does not count of course he's graduated but the Na- the Nationals and Riley Adams isn't either. Um, but the Nationals acquired a lot of, not a lot of, but a good number of position players from the trade deadline who are now a part of this farm system mm-hmm. and have kicked some guys out. So kind of a two part question: Do you see aside from Riley Adams, Caber Ruiz, and let's just 
and obviously Lane Thomas. I guess let's, 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 let's include Donovan Casey. So between Donovan Casey, who was a part of the Max Scherzer Trey Turner deal, Jordy Barley, who was a we got back from uh, Daniel Hudson from the Padres, and uh, Drew Milas, who was a part of the deal with the Athletics with Josh Harrison and jo- uh, Jan Gomes. Which of those three do you see most likely making their debuts this year of position players? I think you're most likely to see Donovan Casey out of all of those. He's the one that's like on the fringe. Right, combination of him being on the fringe just himself and the need for an outfield spot. Um, I think he's probably who we're going to see off of that list, and I'm excited to see him. Yeah, I mean, there's we talked about the Nationals outfield being pretty much set. And you're going to need to find a spot for him most likely in the corner outfield. And that's not going to be in the right field. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you kind of want to see what these guys can do after having acquired them from uh, the trade deadline. We know we saw Josiah Gray. We saw Caber Ruiz, Lane Thomas, of course. The hype around those guys at the end of last season was great. Exactly what a rebuilding team needs. You need to see immediate... Uh, results from guys that you are now, you know, committing your future to. So Donovan Casey will probably probably be the head of the next wave of guys coming up from that group of guys acquired in July. Right. Jordy Barley's made a lot of progress in his development, but they say he's still not a complete player. He's making a lot of errors at shortstop. And obviously you're not going to put somebody in there that, you know, can't play the position and isn't a complete player yet. So he might be the next just because Drew Milas being a catcher, Mm. And he's blocked. I right. mean, by he's blocked for which who thought we would ever hear right? that? <laughs> he's probably the fourth, fifth catcher. Right. On the, if you want to make an organizational depth chart, he's probably right. the fourth or fifth roster. So he's but, not going to be. Yeah. A, so Jordy time. Barley, I think, has the tools. He's mm-hmm. just not complete and ready to make his debut yet. Um, so then that goes into my part two of this conference uh, question, and then uh, we can get out of here. What happened to Drew Mendoza? Dude. That was my. That's, that's kind of tying back to my question about there are no first basemen. Drew Mendoza was a third baseman, but just played a majority of his games last year as a first baseman. Yep. Is is that going to be the guy? Now, he was on top of this Nationals top prospect. He was one of those guys that came into the system, was highly touted because he was one of the few position players in the top 30 and now has now basically been booted out of it because of the draft signings, the international signings, the trades, which is a good thing. But is Drew Mendoza going to become the first baseman of the future as they work him a little more over there as opposed to the hot corner? I think yes, because, I mean, that's where they're working. I mean, he was down in instructs this fall, and they were working a lot with him um, at first base. So I think that's that's going to be his position, and maybe you they are trying to, you know, mold him into potentially the first baseman of the future. Um, he has some of, I mean, at the plate, he has some of the best power and plate discipline, discipline in this entire organization. But when he moved up to double A, he just kind of looked lost. Um, you know, he was behind fastballs in front of breaking stuff, which is pretty on par, you know, when you move up and you're seeing better pitching. Uh, he just really couldn't get it together. So I think they liked the progress that he made at the plate. He, they changed some things in his stance down in instructs and worked a lot with him at first base. So maybe that's a, a conversation that we're going to be having here. He played 61 games and over 527 innings at high a Wilmington at first, and then uh, 19 games and over 147 innings at double a at first base. So it's just another s- switch. And, you know, I, I, th- I was going through this list of putting of the, of the prospects we we're going to talk about. And he kind of popped into my mind. I was like, wait, what happened to yeah. Drew Mendoza? Well, he's been playing first base and, and, you know, he got knocked off these lists because of, you know, the Kate Cavalli's, the, Brady Houses, the Armando Cruises. So that's a guy to keep in mind on that I think has fallen off a lot of Nats fans' radar because of all the new names and, and the fun names to talk about and, that are coming up the system. But he could possibly play a role. You would assume that he would now start at A and be their maybe opening day first baseman. Um, and I think there are only there's only one first baseman, actual first baseman listed in the top 30. Um, and I'm on the wrong year. But uh, so... That could be his path to the majors right now and making that transition from third to first. Um, and, and you know, you, you mentioned he's, he could have the offensive tools, power bat right there at, at first base. Mm-hmm. That could be his path right there to the majors, which I thought was interesting. Right, probably just getting used to better pitching. Um, and it could be a good fit both for him because his skills match better at first base at mm-hmm. this point, but also 
a good thing for the Nationals because that's a big question mark. Yeah, it's a huge question mark going forward. Uh, after this year, we're not quite sure who's going to be the next first baseman of the future, so something to keep in mind. Yeah, and hopefully at this trade deadline, the Nationals are able to get back some more position players that we're going to be able to talk about that can just inject themselves here in, in the top rankings of this prospect list. Um, and then in a few years when they're competitive – they're able to go after some big free agent names yeah. um, to fill some of those extra spots. Like but they've been used to doing. Until yeah. then, draft well, trade well. I was going to say, well number, five overall, uh, <laughs> number five overall in June or June. Yeah, so that's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting moment right there. And like we said, you, don't, you can't draft for, for position in baseball. You got to take the best player that's right. available on your board. You know, we talked about all the pitchers right there. If it's a pitcher, you, you're not going to pass up three top pitchers just to take a position player. In right the national sure no, they definitely won't. But to, you sh just because you need position players doesn't mean you need to go take one right. right there. So they will take the best player available. Who that will be, we obviously don't know. So that'll be interesting to keep in mind as well. Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Mass and All Access podcast. Big thanks to Brendan Mortensen for his help behind the scenes producing the show. Be sure to check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and or SoundCloud. And watch us live every week on uh, the Mass and Nationals Facebook page and YouTube channel. At Amy Jennings News for Amy, I'm at Bobby underscore Blanco at Mass and Nationals across the board for all your Nats content. We'll be back next week right here from the Mass and Web Studio. See you then.